Screen Directors Playhouse stars Joan Fontaine, Charles Drake. Production Ivy, director Sam Wood. This is the Screen Directors Playhouse, the Thursday night feature on NBC's all-star festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Brought to you by the makers of Amazon for fast relief from the pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia, and RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. Tonight, the Screen Director's Playhouse is pleased to present the dramatic study of one woman and of the ambition that was her story. Here now is our adaptation of Ivy, starring Joan Fontaine in her original title role with Charles Drake as Jim. This is Detective Lieutenant Martin, 5th Precinct, New York City. If the story of Ivy Lexton were to be told in sequence, it would begin January 6, 1912, the fateful day she chose to visit a gypsy fortune teller in a gloomy Greenwich Village basement apartment. Somehow, from the moment Ivy seated herself, she instinctively knew that her fate was sealed, that what she'd learn in the next few moments would be the definite pattern of her life, and that there'd be no turning back. Time. Time. What are you saying, Madam Eva? It is not yet clear, but soon I will know. Time. Time. Please, can't you shut off that metronome? It's, it's very annoying. No. When the instrument ceases to beat, so does life cease to exist. Well, all I came here for was to, was to find out what... whether there will be a change for the better in your life. Yes, yes. Yes, there will be a great change. Are you sure? Oh, you don't know how happy you've made me. What what else? There are three men in your life. Yes. One can give you wealth, the wealth you so greatly covet. Miles. The other two men stand in your way. First... My husband. My husband. Tenement, you mean? I, oh, I can't stand this poverty any longer. I'm doing the best I can. I can't help it if times are bad and jobs aren't lying about the streets. Well, if your friends knew the way we live... Oh, why worry about friends? We've had fun. We'll have it again. <laughs> we once had money. That was five years ago. Oh, Jim, what's the use? Oh, come on now, darling. Stop pouting. It's pretty, but it's bad for the morale. How many times have you said those words over and over again to maybe me? Maybe a hundred, maybe two. What difference does it make? All that matters is that I love you. Oh, Jim, we don't belong together. If we were apart, you'd be so much better off. You oh, you wouldn't have to worry about anything but yourself. Darling, silly, Ivy. I couldn't imagine spending my life without you. Not even one day. Now come here, darling, and kiss me. Oh, Jim, don't, please. Oh, oh why don't you understand? There is the other man who stands in the way of what you desire. He loves you as you may never be loved again. Roger. Roger Gritrix. You no longer care for him. He has become troublesome to you. Break with him now. Or if you don't... I've tried. I've tried. I've tried. Ivy, let's go outside on the terrace. Through this door. Oh, Roger, be careful. Jim's watching us. What difference does that make? What's wrong with you tonight, Roger? Same thing that's wrong with me every night. And morning and noon. I'm in love with you. Doesn't that mean anything to you? Roger, I've been so worried lately. Money? Well, it's always that, of course, but... Jim, 
Well, it has to do with him. I don't think I'm being very fair with him. Fair? He's held you in his arms. People point you out as his wife. I think he's about the luckiest man in New York. Oh, you're nice, Roger, but we're forgetting that, that I'm married to him, aren't we? We knew that from the very first. Oh, but it was different then. I don't think I realized how easy it was to drift into things. We didn't drift into this. It started because... It started you... because I was unhappy, because you were something new and exciting in my life, so different from the sort of men I'd known. You're really handsome, you know, and... I was impressed with your background, your family. I... <laughs> not a dime to our name. Oh, but you stood for something then, and oh, you still do, money or not. I thought you were so kind and gentle. It was so noble of you, a clever doctor going down and practicing on the east side in the slums. Now, well, somebody had to take care of those poor devils. I remember the first day I went to your office. Oh, it was a curiosity in the beginning, but the next day when I came there, I saw how you tried to fix the place up, especially for me. And I was so flattered. And I was falling in love. Well, that's just it. I... You've been taking too much for granted. What, for instance? Well, just because I came to see you. Oh, oh it was intriguing. My own key, my own entrance to your dispensary. But, but then you were fun and, and we used to laugh. We still do. No, it's different now that you became so serious. You're determined just because we're good friends. Friends? You... We're in love with each other. I'm not. Ivy. No, it has to stop. You You must stay away from you me. You don't mean that. You can't mean it. Oh, you'll forget me. Forget you? Ask me to stop breathing. It's the same. Oh, darling, darling, I love you. I won't give you up, Ivy, no matter what you say or do. Break with him. Do not see him again. Ever. Because if you do... You'll bring him to misery and shame. And it's well to be off with the old love before you're on with the new. Miles. Miles Rashworth. Rich. Powerful. Someone to be admired. Mr. Rashworth, I, I'm in love with your home. May I confess something? <laughs> when a woman confesses, especially a beautiful one, it's time to beware. <laughs> well, I'm waiting. Very well. I imposed myself on you. I induced your cousin Charlotte to arrange this invitation. You really believe that? I've confessed, haven't I? <laughs> well, I guess it's my turn now. I prevailed on Charlotte to invite you before you asked. Feel better? Oh, much accepted. I know you're just being gallant and saving face for me. Well, I'd better be going on. I, I've already recited my piece, and I've disturbed you long enough. I know you have a lot of things to attend to, from the look of all the papers about oh, your please study. please don't go. It'll keep. But Jim and the others have gone on to the party at Mrs. Dale's. I did promise to join them later. There is something I'd like to ask. Mrs. Ivy, please. Very well. Ivy, I know so little about you. Tell me about yourself. Well, there's not very much to tell. I'm afraid it can be all summed up in a few words. My husband and I are practically paupers. We're, we're awfully broken. Something about you, Ivy. You're both honest and frank. What does Jim do for a living? At the moment, nothing. Well, not any longer. From now on, he's on my company payroll. Oh, but... I can't help but say it. You're, you're wonderful. Oh, you, you'll have me crying in another oh, second. Please, please don't. Oh. Come over here, Ivy. I'd like to show you something of which I'm quite proud. Oh, what a beautiful curio cabinet. And all those lovely things. Yes. That's my weakness. Lovely things. Oh, wherever did you collect them all? Well, here and there. Mostly in Europe, though. Oh, they're wonderful, all of them. They're so beautiful. <laughs> you look like the small girl with jam on her face. Oh, well, I'm sorry. I, I suppose I was carried away. Which do you like the best? Oh, well, they're also... I... <laughs> now I feel like a child pressing my nose against a candy counter. Which do I like? Oh, I know, the, the adorable black handbag. All right. Here, it's yours. Oh, no, really, it's much too expensive. Please. It's yours for next Christmas. Oh, thank you. It, oh, thank you. A, a cameo set in rubies. Yes, and there's something else. See the catch attached to the clasp? You press it. So. Oh. And it's a secret compartment. Oh. 
Oh. It's been said the clasp once belonged to Marie Antoinette. I hope it brings you more luck than it did her. Oh, it will. It will. Let's drink to it. Cherry? Please. May I propose a toast to you? A beautiful adornment in a beautiful setting. Adornment? Yes. Exquisite bric-a-brac. A Dresden doll. A, a portrait worthy of a Rembrandt. Miles. Miles, I'm frightened. It's all right. Don't worry. Oh. Oh, hold me tight. Hold me tight. Yes. Yes. Oh, my Miles. Miles, darling, darling. I... Forgive me, Ivy. Give you? Yes. I'm not the most scrupulous of men. I've made a great deal of money, sometimes at the expense of others. I, I've hurt many people to acquire possessions, but there's one thing I can't do. That's to make love to another man's wife. If only... If only... Yes. Whether the interest of the man you want endures will depend entirely on yourself. With you, the element of time is most important. I cannot say why, but I know this to be true. You must choose the proper course. Madam Eva, you make me very happy. Mrs. Lexton, money is not everything. Don't be misled by golden illusions. But I know what I want. Your foot is upon the path. You've already made your choice. Good day, Madam Eva. Selfish little fool. It's fortune you want, but it's misfortune you'll get. Time changing into terrible misfortune. Galloping down upon you like a riderless horse. No matter what you now take for headache relief, we urge you to try Anison for the incredibly fast relief these tablets bring the next time you're suffering from a headache. Now, the reason Anison is so wonderfully fast-acting and effective is this. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thousands of people have received envelopes containing Anison tablets from their own dentist or physician, and in this way discovered the incredibly fast relief Anison brings from the pains of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. So the next time a headache strikes, take Anison for this wonderfully fast relief. Anison. A N A C I N. Anison at any drug counter in handy boxes of 12 or 30, economical family size bottles of 50 and 100. Now for the second act of the Screen Director's Playhouse presentation of Ivy, starring Joan Fontaine in the title role with Charles Drake as Jim. The incessant beat of the metronome ran through Ivy's mind from the moment she left the gypsy fortune teller. No matter how strongly she tried to rid herself of it, the beat prevailed. And two phrases that Madame Eva uttered disturbed her. When the instrument ceases to beat... So does life cease to exist. With you, the element of time is most important. And time became very urgent when Miles went to London for an indefinite period. Whereupon Ivy knew that the plan she'd formulated to rid herself of the two obstacles that stood in her way, her husband Jim and Roger Grudericks, would have to be put in motion immediately. Well, Emily... And lucky at cards, lucky in love, they say. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Jim is a fine man. The most wonderful one in the world. You serve the party very well, Emily. You're an excellent maid. Thank you, ma'am. If uh, that's Dr. Gredericks again, shall I still tell him you're out? I'll answer it. Uh, I think you'd better start on the silver, Emily. Very well, ma'am. 
Hello? Ivy? Oh, Roger. Ivy, darling, why haven't you phoned me? Well, it, it was for the best. I don't think it's for the best. Is that the Rushworth influence? Oh, there's no need of you to be jealous. All Miles Rushworth has done is to be kind to me. I'm sorry. Ivy, I must see you today. No. Well, if you don't come here, I'll come to you. Well, you wouldn't dare come to this apartment. Oh, yes, I would. I'll expect you in the usual place in an hour. Goodbye. Oh, dearie. Oh, dearie. Oh, dearie, what? Oh, oh it, it's nothing, Jim, nothing. Uh, why are you home so early? Your party over? Apparently. Why did you have to send the bill collector across to the office? Oh, you mean that man from Putnam's? Here I am trying to establish myself on a decent job that you were kind enough to arrange for me with Mr. Rushworth, and you send bill collectors to dun me right in the office. <laughs> oh, darling, you look so funny when you're angry. <laughs> well, I'm not feeling funny. Well, Angel, what else could I do? Putnam said that they wouldn't leave another thing unless they had something on account. Well, perhaps if you'd skip one or two of your bridge parties and... And stay home and bore myself to death? Is that what you want? Well, if you'd only make an effort to be reasonable. Oh, come on now. Put your arm around me. Ivy, I'm trying to talk some sense in the... After all, you're not a child. No, I'm not a child. I'm a foolish, extravagant woman, and everything is my fault. Well, just give me a chance to get on my feet, Ivy, to get out of debt. Oh. We'll have a chance for a decent life. Do stop nagging me. You used to want me to spend money, buy pretty dresses. Now all you do is argue. I'm not arguing, Ivy. I'm simply trying to tell you I haven't got Rushworth's... Millions? Yes, I know. I'm making $4,000 a year. Ivy, you can spend every penny of it any way you please. But if you spend more than I'm earning, we're back where we started. Oh, Jim, dear, I'm sorry. Of course you're right. Huh? Oh, darling, I, I've made such a mess of things for you, and I guess I always will. It's the way I am. Why, why don't you do the, the same thing and get a divorce? I've said I'd never divorce you in a million years. I won't. Oh, Come on, come on, cheer up. Forget what I said. Do whatever makes you happy. Besides, you got Rushworth to give me my job. How long do you think I could hold it without you as my sponsor? But if, but if we go on, Jim, there'll be nothing but years of petty wrangling. And... Oh, we'll survive the wrangling. But we'll live those years together. Now, come over here. Let me kiss away those tears. Oh, no, no, don't touch me. It only makes me feel worse. Oh, why must you make me hate you? Leave me alone. Leave me alone. I'm here, Roger, in your dispensary. Yes. Well, I don't suppose I should have said what I did on the phone. But I can't say I'm sorry it brought you here. Well, I must say you didn't give me much choice. You didn't give me much choice either. I was terribly hurt when I found out about you going to parties with Miles Rushworth. Jim was with me. Jim's presence is no assurance. <laughs> don't be absurd. No man could be near you, touch you, or speak to you without falling in love with you. Roger, sometimes you say that... Silliest, nicest things. You know, you shouldn't have telephoned me this afternoon. Oh, darling, I can't explain what happens to me when I don't see you or hear from you. I've even thought of going to Jim and explaining everything to him and begging him to give you up. Well, whatever made you dream of such a thing as going to Jim? You know he's refused time and again to agree to a divorce. Well, there's some consolation in that. If I can't make you my wife, neither can any other man. As long as Jim lives. No. No, I... I'm sorry, I'm, I'm at the end of my road. I know I am. I, what have I got to look forward to? Always poverty, always bills, always Jim harping at me. I, I can't go on like this. <laughs> Dr. Roger, come quick. Martha, I told you never to enter this room without knocking first. I know, sir, but something terrible has happened. I'm busy, Martha. It's Mrs. Parslow's little boy. He's hurt very badly. I can't come now, Martha. Oh, you've got to come, Dr. Roger. It's little Peter who likes you so much. He's bleeding something awful. I'll get your bag. No, 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 I'll get it. You get the antiseptic on the medicine shelf. Here it is, sir. No, no, Martha, not this one. It's poison. The antiseptic's on the second shelf. Oh, here you are, sir. All right, all right. Go on now, Martha. Tell him I'll be there in a moment. Yes, sir. I, I'll be leaving, Roger. No, darling, you mustn't. Not yet. I'll only be ten minutes. Then we can talk things out. We've got to. There's a point at which one must make a decision. Wait for me, please, darling. There's a point at which one must make a decision. You don't know, but you've made things very simple for me, Roger. Just a few grains from that jar is the answer. 
Just a few grains in the cameo of my black bag. There. I... Uh, I beg your pardon, ma'am. What... What is it that you want, Martha? Nothing. Nothing, ma'am. If you'll give me that bottle of poison, I'll put it back on the shelf. I'm sorry if I upset you, ma'am. Hello, Ivy. You're late coming home. <laughs> Don't get up, Jim, dear. That's the way a real wife should behave. And where could a man find a better one? How about fixing me a brandy and soda? Of course, darling. Don't ever let's quarrel again. You know something? I've been holding out on you. I have exactly $100 in a savings account. How about you going on a shopping spree? Oh, no. From here on in, I'm helping you save money. Here's your drink. Thanks, dear. Mm. Tastes a little bitter. Oh, that's just your imagination. Come on now. Bottoms up. <laughs> Mrs. Lexton. Yes, Emily? Uh, doctor, the doctor called again for the third time. Well, if he calls again, say I'm not at home. Uh, yes, ma'am. And Ma'am, I- I'm sorry to disturb you, but Mr. Lexton was ill during the night. I-, I wanted to send for a doctor, but he wouldn't let me. Thank you, Emily. I'll go right in and see him. Hello, Angel. How are you feeling, Jim? <laughs> I feel like I swallowed a salamander. Here, sit on the edge of my bed. Your throat burning? Yeah, it's drier than the great Gobi Desert. Or just too many brandies and sodas. Emily shouldn't have bothered you. Emily should have bothered me much sooner. Oh, I'll be all right. I got to be. I've got a heavy day at the office coming. Oh, no, Jim, you mustn't go to the office. I'll tell you what, idea. Go get me another brandy and soda. That'll make me feel better. Are you sure? Go on, no, just a little one. And not too much soda. <laughs> Ma'am, he's worse again. Who's with him, Emily? I hear voices. Oh, he took terribly sick. His throat was so hot and he was swearing something awful. I got frightened, so I called the doctor. The doctor? Dr. Lanchester. Oh, excuse me. Oh, there you are, Mrs. Lexton. It was kind of you to come so quickly, doctor. Jim, dear, I'm sorry you're feeling so bad again. And he's got himself to blame. It's high time he learned brandy and soda can be poison. Poison? <laughs> to some folks, it's just that. I'm placing him on a milk and broth diet. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. And you're going to see to it that he sticks to it. Oh, I will. I, I will. Well, goodbye. Be back tomorrow. Poor dear Jim. You have tickets for the show tonight, haven't you? Yes, but I'm not going... Not with the way you're feeling. Oh, please go. I'm nuisance enough as it is. No, you're not. All this stupid expense of doctors and nonsense. You must hate me for it. No, I I don't hate you. I I sometimes wish I weren't so fond of you. Oh, darling. Now, be a good boy and do what the doctor tells you. I'm I'm going to start immediately on your milk and broth diet. Operator, are you getting me Orchard 3252? Thank you. Hello, Roger? How are you, darling? I I have a favor to ask. Jim's not feeling very well, and and I'm worried. It's his throat, and... Oh, Roger, please make him stop drinking brandies and soda. You drop by? Oh, good. Thanks, darling. Eight o'clock sharp. See you then, darling. Operator, Lacawana 1411, please. Hello? Dr. Lanchester, please. Oh, it's you. Doctor, Jim isn't doing very well, and, and I'm extremely worried. When can you come by and see him? Seven o'clock? Well, Doctor, if you don't mind, could you make it a few minutes past eight so that I could be there? Thank you, Doctor. <laughs>
Good evening. Mrs. Lexton in, please? Uh, no, sir. Not now, sir. Oh, when will she be back? Oh, she won't be in till late, sir. Uh, who is it, Emily? Who's there? It's Roger. Roger Gretorix. Uh, Roger, come on in. Thank you. Hello, Roger. Jim. Jim, what's happened? Oh, just a little bit under the weather. Something I've eaten. Oh, I'm sorry. My throat's as dry as a board. I could use a brandy and soda. Yeah, well, I'm not too sure what a brandy and soda would do to you. Have you any better suggestions? Well, water can't do you any harm. I'll pour you some. Here. It's only fit for dogs and horses. Here goes. Say, look who's here. Dr. Lanchester. Time for a consultation, Doc. Meet Dr. Gretorix. How do you do? Hello. Consultation? I don't think I understand. Sorry, Doctor. That was meant to be funny. Dr. Gretorix is a very good friend of mine and Ivy's. I was just asking him if he knew of some way to, to cool this red-hot poker in my throat. I'm sorry, Doctor. I had no idea you were on the case. I've been running along, Jim. I know you're in excellent hands. Good afternoon, Doctor. What's this? Not more brandy and soda, I hope. You hope the unpleasantest things, Doctor. What is he giving you? <laughs> Something terribly dangerous. Water. But, operator, can't you have her paged? Really, it's urgent. Yes, that's right, Mrs. James Lexton. Please. Thank you, I'll wait. What's the matter, Emily? For goodness sakes, you're as pale as a ghost. Oh, thank heavens you're home, Mrs. Lexton. It's so awful. Awful. Please, Emily, what's wrong? <laughs> Mrs. Lexton? Yes. Who are you? I'm Dr. Barrick. I, I, I couldn't get Dr. Lanchester, ma'am, so I ran downstairs for Dr. Barrick. He lives in the building. My husband, he, he isn't worse. He's, he's dead. Oh, no. No. You have to keep hold of yourself, Mrs. Lexton. Here, ma'am, take this sip of brandy. Oh, I can't believe it. It isn't possible. Had Dr. Lanchester realized how serious this was? Oh, no, no, nor had I. Oh. Well, this places me in a peculiar position. Although he was Dr. Lanchester's patient, I'm afraid I shall have to ask for a post-mortem. Post-mortem? But, but I don't understand. Oh, Jim, my poor darling Jim. I, I never should have gone out tonight, left him alone. What am I going to do without him? What am I going to do? I know it's painful to discuss it now, <laughs> Mrs. Lexton. But it's necessary that this examination be made to determine the cause of death. Time. Time changing into terrible misfortune. Our drama will continue in just a moment. But now, here's a word from RCA Victor. When you go out to dinner, you know it's a lot cheaper to order from the dinner menu rather than a la carte. That's how it works when you buy things all at once. They cost less money. And when you buy your home entertainment all at once, you're in for some real savings there, too. For example, when you get RCA Victor's complete combination unit, you can get two radios, both AM and FM, two record changers which play all record speeds, and RCA Victor's million-proof television, proven in well over a million homes. Get all five instruments in one beautiful cabinet, and they all play through RCA Victor's matchless golden throat tone system. Yet they cost you many dollars less than you'd ever pay for separate instruments of comparable quality. It's a wonderful way to save, and it's wonderful to enjoy all the entertainment in the world right in your own living room. So don't delay See the wide variety of million-proof television combinations at your RCA Victor dealers today. You are listening to the Screen Director's Playhouse, the Thursday night feature on NBC's All-Star Festival, brought to you by the makers of Anison for fast relief from the pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia, and by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. The Screen Director's Playhouse presentation of Ivy, starring Joan Fontaine with Charles Drake, will continue after a short pause for station identification.
This is the Screen Director's Playhouse. We continue with the third act of Ivy, starring Joan Fontaine in her original title role with Charles Drake as Jim. The thought of facing a post-mortem didn't shock Ivy, for it was part of her plan, and it figured importantly in her calculations. As she stood poised behind her bedroom door, listening intently to her maid Emily being questioned, there was almost a smile of contempt and absolute assurance on her face. You're quite sure you and Mrs. Lexton were the only persons who saw Mr. Lexton yesterday? Uh, that's right, sir, in a manner of speaking. What do you mean by that? Uh, well, there was Dr. Gredericks, of course. Was Dr. Gredericks on the case? Uh, oh, no, sir, he, he wasn't on the case. He, he was just a friend of Mrs., uh, you know, um... Mr. and Mrs. Lexton. Why did you start to say of Mrs.? Uh, well, uh, he asked for Mrs. Lexton when he came in, sir. Did he come often? Uh, uh, oh, no, sir. Uh, not until yesterday. Did he telephone her often? Oh, yes, sir. Often. Uh, not that she'd ever speak to him. Oh, she was devoted to her husband. If Dr. Gredericks phones, I'm not at home, she'd say. Mm. What? Who is this gentleman, Emily? Mrs. Lexton. Yes? I'm Detective Lieutenant Martin. Detective. I have to ask a few questions. That is, if you feel up to it. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm not feeling very well. I, I was about to go for a walk. You see, I've had a terrible shock, and I, I wanted to think. I know, I know. I'm sorry. I'm afraid I have another shock for you, Mrs. Lexton. Would oh. you please sit down for a moment? Yes, thank you. Your husband didn't die a natural death. He died of a virulent poison. Poison? That's why I'm here. Mrs. Lexton, did your husband have anything to eat or drink yesterday while you were with him? Why, yes, he had some milk and hot broth. But that was all right, wasn't it? Dr. Lanchester ordered it. Perfectly all right. Tell me, your husband's life was insured, of course. No, Jim wasn't insured at all. I don't like to trouble you with these questions, but... You left your well provided for? No, we... Lived on his salary, and all he had left was a lot of debts. Sorry. Well, I'll be all right. I, I'll find a job or something. You're very brave, Mrs. Lixton. There's one other small matter, and then I won't bother you anymore. Yes? Your friend, Dr. Gredericks. Our friend, Mr. Martin. That's right. Did you know that he was coming here yesterday? No. W was he here? He was with your husband a few hours before he died. I, I, I didn't know. I understand he's been telephoning you quite a bit lately. But I didn't talk to him. So I'm told. But I wouldn't be misconstruing the case if I were to say that he's more your friend than your husband's. That's true, Lieutenant. You're very wise admitting it. You saw him alone at times? Well, at times, but, but not often. At his own house? No, we'd go for walks in the park or, or to picture galleries. I understand. In other words, you were quite fond of him. I'm very fond of Dr. Gredericks, but I loved my husband. Naturally. Was Dr. Gredericks jealous of Mr. Lexton? Please don't bother to answer that question if you don't want to. Well, I... I suppose he was in a way, but make no mistake, Roger's a wonderful man. I have no doubt of that. After all, he could hardly be blamed for falling in love with you and wanting to marry you. Well, I suppose it was as much my fault as it was his. You encouraged him? No, the opposite, but I... I could have been firmer. What did your husband say to all this? He didn't know. You never told him? No. He would have been so hurt, you see. He trusted Roger as a friend. Oh, I see. Mrs. Lexton, in your opinion... If your husband had found out what Dr. Gredericks's feelings really were, do you think that he might have taken his own life? Oh, no, no, don't, don't even say that. You, oh, he couldn't have done such a thing. You're sure of that? Well, of course he couldn't. Oh, you didn't know, Jim. I'm sorry I didn't. He sounds like a pretty nice fellow. Dr. Gredericks lives on Sutton Place, doesn't he? Yes, I, I think he does. Mm. Mrs. Lexton, I'm very grateful to you for being so frank with me and... Please accept my very sincere sympathy. Thank you, Lieutenant. Goodbye, Mrs. Lexton. It's 
misfortune you want. It's misfortune you'll get. Time galloping down on you like a riderless horse. This bag, my beautiful black bag. Poison in it. Evidence against me. Oh, there'll be no evidence. I'll hide it. But where? The, the fireplace? No, no. The clock. Yes. Back of the grandfather clock. Ivy. Roger. Something awful has happened. It's Jimmy's dead. He died last night. Oh, darling, I'm so oh, sorry. Talk quickly. This man is coming here to your office. Man? Oh, it's so dreadful. I'm so frightened. They say that, that poor Jim didn't die a, a natural death. Didn't die a natural death? Oh, I, I don't know what to think or talk. This horrible man came to see me, a, a police lieutenant, and now he's coming here to see you. But why? I don't know. He asked such funny questions about you and me, and... Oh, Roger, you won't give me away, will you? Give you away? Well, he wanted to know if you were more of a friend of mine than, than of Jim's, and I... I said that you weren't, that you were a good friend of us both. What else did he ask? Well, he wanted to know if, if you were fond of me, if you loved me, and I said that, that you didn't, and, and then he, he asked if I ever came here to see you alone. And, oh, darling, hold me in your arms. I, I'm so terribly frightened. Easy, dear, easy. He asked that, huh? Yes, and I said that I hadn't. What else could I say? But if you say that I have It's nobody's here, business but our own. Oh, yes, I know, but... Oh, if it gets into the papers, it, oh, it's all so awful. Darling, darling, of course, I'll never say you've been here, but you shouldn't have come here now. What if you've been followed? Oh, no, I wasn't. I, I was very careful. I still don't understand this. If poor Jim took his own life, do you, do you think he knew about us? Oh, no, I'm sure he didn't. Nobody did, but everybody will if you... If don't you... worry, don't worry, they won't. Darling, we can't see each other for a while. We... We're both going to hate it, but... Yes, it would be better if you went away, away from the city. No, 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 that wouldn't be wise. See, this means an inquest, and then... Roger, I love you, darling. I love you. Who's there? Martha, Dr. Roger. There's a gentleman waiting out front to see you. I'll be with you in a moment, Martha. You better go, sweetheart. Yes, you will be careful, won't you? Dearest, when all this is over with, you and I... Thanks, my darling. I'll, I'll go now. Wait, wait. Wait till I leave and then slip out. Oh, yes, Roger. What if, if Martha sees me here? I'll attend to that. You mustn't worry, darling. I won't let anybody harm you. Oh, thank you, Roger. Well, Martha. Martha, will you do something for me? You know I would. You've seen Mrs. Lexton here. I want you to forget it. Forget that I've ever seen her here? That's right. It means a lot to me, and you may be asked, no matter how it appears to you, no matter what you think would be for the best, remember, you'll be helping me if you never tell a soul. If it means something to you, Dr. Roger, then it means much more to me, I promise. Thank you, Martha. I know I can trust you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Gretericks? Yes? And Detective Lieutenant Martin. Oh, how do you do? Have a chair. Thank you. Sorry to bother you, but I have to ask you one or two questions about a gentleman whom I believe was known to you. Well, if you give me his name, I'll look up the case. Oh, no, no, he wasn't a patient of yours. I'm referring to Jim Lexton. Who died last night. No. He wasn't a patient of mine. That's what I thought. But he was a friend of yours. Yes. You understand, Doctor, when a thing like this happens, it's my job to explore every possibility. I, uh, suppose you can't give us any idea how Lexton could have come by irritant poison? Well, no, I can't. I mean, it isn't possible that he could have obtained or, let's say, annexed some of it here. Jim Lexton never came to this house. Did his wife ever come here, Doctor? No. Hmm. I don't want to get personal, Doctor, but I understand that you were more, shall I say, friendly with Mrs. Lexton than her husband. What exactly do you mean by that? Well, some sort of romantic attachment. If you mean what I think you yes, mean... Yes, Doctor. There were occasions when you used to see Mrs. Lexton alone? No. Not even for a walk in the park? No. I see. You never even gave her a passing thought. Mrs. Lexton is a very beautiful lady. I imagine it might be hard for any man not to wish to... Fall in love with her? I agree with you. And you admit that if there hadn't been any Mr. Lexton, that you would have wanted Mrs. Lexton to be your wife. There was a Mr. Lexton. That doesn't answer my question. You do want to marry her, don't you? She's already admitted as much. That I know is an unmitigated lie. Really? 
I suppose you have a dispensary attached to this house? Yes, in the rear. You fill your own prescriptions, of course? That's correct. I'd like to look it over, if you don't mind. I can save you time. I'm in possession of irritant poison, but no one has any access to it but my housekeeper, Martha, and myself. I have no idea how Jim Lexton got the stuff that killed him, if it killed him. But I do know it didn't come from my stock. That may be, but in my opinion, Doctor, at this moment there is only one logical suspect, and that's you. What are you talking about? No one else ha had as strong a motive as you. You wanted Lexton out of the way so you could marry his wife, and you had the tools and access to the victim. I think you better come along with me. I'm going to book you on suspicion of murder. In two hours, Dr. Gretericks, we go to court. You just have to cooperate with me. I've told you before, Mr. Thomas, I have no need of an attorney. You've got to listen, man. You're throwing your life away. I'm not worried. The prosecution believes they can convict you. I still don't understand it. Why are you involved? Where was your motive? You admitted you saw Mr. Lexton the day he died, but so did Miss Dr. Lanchester. So did the maid, Emily Green. Of course, the wife saw him, too. What would be her motive? There was no life insurance, no money. Now, if she wanted to marry another man... Uh, doctor, are you sure you've told me all the facts? Was this woman in love with you? Certainly not. Or somebody else? No. Not to my knowledge. If there is anything, you'd better tell me, you know. Remember, you'll be under oath when I put you on the witness stand. I won't go on the witness stand, Mr. Thomas. What's that? I will not testify under any circumstances. The state contends that Roger Gretericks is guilty of murder in the first degree. Dr. Lanchester... You were the first to examine the victim, weren't you? Yes, sir. And in your opinion, medically at that time, you found no sign of poisoning? No, sir. You witnessed a scene where Dr. Gretericks gave some sort of drink to the victim? Uh, yes, sir. What was that drink? Uh, Mr. Lexton said it was water. Mrs. Lexton. Oh, Mrs. Gretericks, I want to talk to you about my son's life. Well, I... I know appearances are against him, but you don't believe that Roger poisoned your husband, do you? You believe he's innocent, don't you? Well, how do I know what to think? I, I mean, it's, it's all so strange. It's unfortunate that, that Roger was one of the last persons to see my husband alive. You mean you believe he did this terrible thing because he was in love with you? Oh, I didn't say that, but he was very fond of me, you know. And Roger he... loved you. He told me so. And because of that, please remember when you face him from the witness chair that what you say may very well be his death. Next witness, Ivy Lexton. That's you, Mrs. Lexton. <coughs> Repeat after me. I swear by the Almighty God... I swear by the Almighty God... That the evidence I give to this court... That the evidence I give in this court... Shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You are Ivy Lexton, widow of the late James Lexton? Yes. Mrs. Lexton, your maid, Emily Green, has testified that the defendant used to telephone you sometimes as often as three times a day, but that you would never talk with him. Was that testimony true, Mrs. Lexton? Yes. Now, Mrs. Lexton, what was the nature of your relations to and with Dr. Gretericks? I... I... Yes, oh, Mrs. Lexton? But we were friends, all, all three of us, my husband, too. Mrs. Lexton, was there, unknown to your husband, any romantic relationship between you and the defendant seated at the table? I... Oh. Was the defendant in love with you? What well, must I answer? I demand that you answer. Oh, please. All right. Mrs. Lexton, the morning after your husband's death, did you tell Detective Lieutenant Martin anything? What did you tell him? Very well. I'll tell you. You told him that Dr. Gretericks was in love with you and wanted to marry you. And didn't you imply to the lieutenant that the defendant was a jealous man? You did tell the lieutenant these things, didn't you, Mrs. Lexton? Didn't you? Yes. Your Honor, if you please, I wish to withdraw my plea. What did you say, Dr. Gretericks? 
I wish to change it to guilty. He's in an awful hurry to get that rope around his neck, isn't he, Lieutenant? Very interesting. So is she. Here's a telegram for you, Mrs. Lexton. Heard of your terrible tragedy. I'm winding up my affairs as quickly as possible to be with you. Deepest sympathy, Miles! Miles! We'll be together soon. Everything's working out for me. For me! Are you talking to me, Mrs. Lexton? No, no, Emily. Emily, uh, are my bags all packed? I'm anxious to get started. Oh, I don't blame you, ma'am. After all you've been through, everything's taken care of. I was just about to get James to take them down the elevator. Oh, good. I'll, I'll be at Mr. Rushworth's home in the country if you want me. Miss Charlotte's been such a dear to insist on my going there on this little vacation. A good thing, too, ma'am. You will take care of yourself? Oh, of course. Now, run along like a good girl. Yes, Miss Lexton. Mrs. Lexton. What is it, Emily? Have you forgotten something? It isn't Emily. It's Mrs. Gratterix. Oh. Mrs. Lexton, why have you refused to see me? I'm awfully sorry, Mrs. Gratterix. I, I'm leaving town. I... Until it's all over. Until my son is dead. Why, staying in New York wouldn't help the poor darling. It might. It's nearly five o'clock. Do you realize it's only 16 hours? They're hanging him in 16 hours. Roger loved you. Why don't you try to help him? Well, how can I help him? Your husband could have committed suicide. Oh, no, he, he wasn't that sort of person. He may have suspected you and my son, and he might have taken the poison so that you and Roger would be accused of the murder. What a horrible thought. You're speaking of my dead husband. And I'm fighting for my son's life. Well, I, well, I've done everything I could. If Roger dies tomorrow morning, the person who killed your husband will go free. Is that what you want? You seem to forget that Roger confessed. It took you a long time to remember that. What? Why is everyone so cruel to me? Nobody seems to realize what I've been through. All the nervous strain and notoriety. You just have to excuse me, Mrs. Gratterix. I, I can't talk to you any longer. You, you don't want to help him, do you, Mrs. Lexton? Well, I, I've done everything I could. Good, good day, Mrs. Gratterix. Good day, Mrs. Lexton. <laughs> Good evening, Mother. Oh, it's you, Lieutenant Martin. Mind if I sit down here in the dispensary? Uh, Mrs. Gretterix is out. She went out early this morning and hasn't yet returned. I didn't come here to see Mrs. Gretterix, Martha. I came to see you. Me? Yes. Oh, good evening, Mrs. Gretterix. Hello, Martha. What is it you want, Lieutenant? I just dropped in to have a talk with Martha, but uh, since you're here, I'm curious to know why you called on Mrs. Lexton today. Is that illegal? How is she? Still frightened? Yes, she's frightened. She's terribly frightened. But she's ready to let Roger die rather than to say whom he's... Shielding? Do you think he's shielding somebody too? Officially, this case is closed. I have no right to think, but this is my night off. You do think it, though. Who would she want him to shield, Mrs. Gretterix? I think you know. Herself? Yes, yes! And that's why Roger said he did it, to save her. And how easy for her to get the poison here, too. All she would have had to do was reach onto that cupboard. Martha here said over and over again that Mrs. Lexton has never been here. Isn't that so, Martha? Yes, that, that's right, sir. Oh, but he wouldn't have told Martha or anyone her reputation. She could have used that door. Yes. Only today I learned that Dr. Gretterix had an extra key made for that door a year ago. Did you know that, Martha? No, sir. I I'm afraid, ma'am, the coffee pot will be running out. She could have slipped in here without anybody knowing about it. Oh, I'm so sure of it, Lieutenant. So positive. But... Oh, it's the use. I couldn't prove anything. This jar on the shelf labeled poison was exhibit number one at the trial. Anybody who was in this room could reach in and get it as easily as I can. Martha, this jar, did you ever see anyone take it up? Oh, what? What is he doing with that in his hands? The poison. Why should this jar frighten oh, you? I broke the cups and spilled the coffee. Never mind them. Well, I'll, I'll go make some more coffee. Never mind the coffee. Martha, in 15 hours, 15 short hours, Dr. Grutterix will be hanged. Uh, 
Paying for something he didn't do. He's shielding somebody, and you know who he's shielding. Martha, what are you keeping from us? Please, please. Say it. But I promise. You promised what? You promised whom? Oh, tell me. Tell me. You've seen Mrs. Lexington here. You know she was here. Was she, Martha? Please, was she? Yes, she was here. Oh, all dressed in white, and she had a little black bag, a sort of unusual with a cameo class. I've seen that bag. The first time I called on her. She was standing there by the medicine cupboard, and before her was the jar of poison, and she was slipping some of it in her bag. Oh. Mrs. Gretarix, you get Martha over to my office. They'll take her statement. I've got a visit to make. <laughs> Speak up, Emily. It's difficult to hear you on this telephone. Uh, there's a cable here for you. Well, uh, open it and read it, please. Oh, I'm all thumbs. What with being in this apartment alone where Mr. Jim died and poor Dr. Gretarick's going to be hanged in the morning. Oh, forgive me, ma'am. I, I've got the jitters. Oh, if I could only go to my sister's for the night. Of course. What does the cable say? Uh, yes, ma'am. Here it is. Arriving New York late tonight. Pier 26. Meet you at your apartment. Ever, Miles Rushworth. Put it on my desk. I'm leaving for home immediately. Dr. Barrick, thanks for accompanying me here to Mrs. Lexton's apartment. You've brought me luck. What do you mean, Lieutenant? We came to find a weapon, and I think we got the motive. Ever hear of... Miles Rushworth. Miles Rushworth, the millionaire? Yes, there's a cable here from him. Seems that Ivy has a way with men. Three of them dangling. Mm. And one almost from the neck in just a few short hours. Rushworth's the one she'd want. Big fish for small fry. Keep hunting for the bag, Doctor. I'm going down to Pier 26 to meet Mr. Miles Rushworth. I'll call you from there. What are you doing here in the apartment? I, I thought you told me you were going to your sister's. Oh, I just had to return. I have the most wonderful news. Yes? It's all over the papers. New evidence has been found. Dr. Gretarix has been reprieved. Reprieved? What, what is this new evidence? You didn't say. Now they won't harm Dr. Gretarix. They'll get the guilty ones, you'll see. I'll unpack your bag. The guilty one? New evidence? Oh, oh it must be some mistake. They couldn't have found out. They couldn't. Oh, Miles. Miles will see to it. He won't let them hurt me. Oh, Miles will see to it. <gasps> oh, Miles. How did you get in my room? I've been waiting for you. Oh, you frighten me. Oh, you, you never know how wonderful it is to see you. Oh, Oh, I've, I've counted the days. I've counted the hours. You're trembling, Ivy. Why are you frightened? Frightened? You are frightened. Terribly frightened. It's in your eyes. Why should I be? Oh, awful things have happened since you went away. Poor darling Jim and the worries I've been through. Have you heard that Dr. Gratterix has been reprieved? Yes, I, I, I'm glad. I mean, if, if they think he's innocent. If Dr. Gratterix is innocent, who is the guilty one? Oh, please, let's not talk about it anymore. Poor Jim's death, and... Oh, it's also unexplainable. Not to Lieutenant Martin. He was waiting for me at the pier when I arrived. Lieutenant... He believes he has enough evidence to convict you of murder. Oh, you don't believe that. I didn't know what to believe. That's why I came to see you, to speak to you. And now? Now I know. I'm sorry for you, Ivy. Deeply sorry. Goodbye. Miles, no! If you leave me now, I haven't a friend left in the world! <laughs> what shall I do now? Where can I turn? Where can I go? Time. Time betrayed you. Time betrayed? The bag, my black bag. I, they can't convict me without evidence. I'll destroy it. I'll destroy it. Clock's ticking again. They found it. It's the fortune you want, a 
but it's misfortune you'll get. No! When the instrument ceases to beat, so will life cease to exist. I could run away and hide, but for how long and then what? Operator, get me Detective Lieutenant Martin of the Police Department. Lieutenant, this is Ivy Lexton. I'll be waiting for you when you arrive. So ends our Screen Director's Playhouse presentation of Ivy and two superb performances by Joan Fontaine and Charles Drake. Next Thursday, the Screen Director's Playhouse presents for the first time on radio the 20th Century Fox outstanding hit, The Big Lift. And our stars will be Paul Douglas and Edmund O'Brien with Screen Director George Seaton. Be sure and listen. And now, here again is tonight's star, Joan Fontaine. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the time for introductions, when you're accustomed to meet the director of the picture we've adapted. But tonight, instead of giving you the man, we can give you only his memory. For Ivy was directed by the late Sam Wood. I think that any words spoken about Sam now should come from a person who knew him much better and much longer than I did. A past president of the Screen Directors Guild and himself one of the great names of motion picture direction, Mr. George Marshall. Thank you. Thank you very much. For you, the audience, the memory of a director can be no deeper and no broader than the memory of the pictures he created. And if you're still thrilled by the remembrance of such motion pictures as the Stratton story, For Whom the Bell Tolls, and Goodbye, Mr. Chips... Well know that these and so many more were the life's work of Sam Wood. The statue they have in your memory and the dramatization tonight of Sam's film, Ivy, these are really the highest tribute that you or I can pay him. Thank you very much. Ivy was presented through the courtesy of Universal International Pictures, who will soon world premiere Tomahawk, a Technicolor production co-starring Van Heflin and Yvonne DiCarlo. Joan Fontaine can currently be seen in September Affair, a Hal Wallace production for Paramount. Charles Drake can now be seen in Harvey, a Universal International Picture starring Jimmy Stewart. George Marshall's latest picture for Paramount is Fancy Pants, starring Bob Hope and Lucille Ball. Tonight's cast included Gerald Moore as Roger Gretterix, also Noreen Gamil, uh, John Stevenson, Ruth Parrott, Paul McVeigh, Frank Gerstel, Ken Christie, and Eleanor Audley. Ivy was adapted for radio by Jack Rubin. The Screen Director's Playhouse is produced by Howard Wiley and directed by Bill Karn. This is Jimmy Wallington speaking and inviting you to listen next Thursday when we present Paul Douglas and Edmund O'Brien in The Big Lift with Screen Director George Seaton. <laughs> Listen again next week to Screen Director's Playhouse, the Thursday night feature on NBC's all-star festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Listen tomorrow evening to the one and only Duffy's Tavern, the Friday night feature of the all-star festival. Join Archie and the gang at Duffy's Tavern tomorrow night on NBC.